Right, I believe that is us live. I am here with one Peter R. Aquinas. Is hey, how are you doing? I'm not bad. Apologies. <laughs> Apologies, I'm the one who made this late. Oh, no, Apologies. it's all right. The two minutes late in the in the distant right community is, that's practically early. Everybody likes being <laughs> fashionably late these days. Oh, man. How have you been, though? What? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, so, what are we talking about today? Uh, we are going to have a look at... If I can go and grab something quickly. Yes, uh, anarcho-tyranny, which is an idea talked about frequently by Sam Francis, but I think best described partially in the Chronicles article that we have for today. Uh, I just need to grab one other thing and I can go and find that. Chronicles, which I am a subscriber to. That's that's one I need to probably actually subscribe to at some point. Because I, I now, my like, Paul Gottfried number is now very small. I, I know <laughs> people that know him, so I now feel like I need to. <laughs> yeah. A lot of good stuff from Pedro Gonzalez, too. and. Um... Yes, someone tipped uh, him off to me as a fellow right-wing Leninist, I believe. <laughs> well, we shall see. I don't. I'm not. I had a chance to meet him uh, a couple weeks ago, but I was in Florida. Mm. He was appearing, doing a talk like a half hour away from here, and I just happened to be scheduled to be in Florida, so that sucked. Yeah, it is a shame. Right. Uh... I don't know if you've got anything else you want to go into, or we can just sort of crack on with the article straight away. Let's do it. Let's cool. do it. I got it opened up too. Cool. Uh, just grab my notes as well. Whoop. There we go. Uh, right, that should. Sorry, <laughs> I am just double checking because I need to. I need to make sure this is all sitting right because otherwise I'll make a mess of it. And it is my first go at this, so I <laughs> to apologise for it. <clears throat> On the morning of September 22nd, 1993, a law-abiding citizen named B.W. Sanders was driving his car around, around the street in Raleigh, North Carolina, when all of a sudden he found himself flagged down by a policeman and presented with a ticket for $25. Mr. Sanders, it turned out, had not been wearing his seatbelt, and under a new state law, that crime carries the penalty he received. But in this case, it was not just a traffic cop who flagged him down, Mr. Sanders, or sorry, but in this case, it was not just a traffic cop who flagged down Mr. Sanders. It was a force of some six dozen police officers, as well as the governor of North Carolina himself, James B. Hunt. Say, but it's not James C. Hunt. The uh, governor was searching for a photo op, which to advertise both the new seatbelt law and his own personal devotion to law and order. <laughs> Not only the 70 or more police officers, but also a numeral supply of newspaper reporters and TV newsmen were there on the scene to record the governor's triumphs over the forces of lawlessness. Every time I read that first paragraph back, it always gets better and better. It's like, how can you put that much sarcasm in there and it's still his legible English? You might as well just put, you know, in the fourth and state in tow. Uh, and the next day, Mr. Sanders' wicked ways were recorded in public press for his family, his employers, his neighbours, and indeed posterity to gander at. To make doubly certain that criminals like Mr. Sanders got the message loud and clear, Governor Hunt held a news conference near the state capitol and harangued a crowd of some 150 police officers and state troopers. Hey, where are we? Who... Were able to take the time or table take the time off from the apprehension of public enemies like Mr. Sanders to attend the governor's words. I took an oath to protect the people of North Carolina, intoned the Tar Heel State answer to Dirty Harry. <laughs> this is the one way we must do it. Folks, we are serious. We mean it. We're going to do this. And indeed serious he is. As part of the war on unbuckled seatbelt crisis, the Rally News and Observer reported law officers in all 100 counties of the state will intensify their efforts to find and cite motorists not using their seatbelts. Agencies will compete against each other, winning cash for turning in the best performance. Which, to me, already kind of highlights kind of the, the main issue 
well, the, the whole you know we'll get more into the framework he's discussing here, but if you know if law and order no longer stands as its own sort of higher values, you know there is there is no divine order to appeal to that you would find in say like a, sort of Christian metaphysics or whatever else, and order is just whoever can hand out the most tickets for minor traffic violations as opposed to, you know, enforcing a, a right and good justice upon people and it's not really that much of an order, is it? <laughs> well, it is because he needs absolute order. He wants ab- he wants everybody to comply to his mandate and let's face it, seatbelt laws they only exist for we know this because studies have been done. The first seatbelt laws were passed in California. California is always a testing ground, a petri, petri dish for things like this. And it was lobbied into existence from health insurance companies and um, auto insurance companies. Mm. And why? Because they, they did studies saying that if people wore seatbelts, they, would, they wouldn't... Um, wouldn't get hurt as bad as if they were as if they weren't wearing a seatbelt. So, basically, the reason why we wear seatbelts anywhere in the world that it is mandated is because health insurance companies don't want to pay, you know, don't want you to have to don't want to pay premiums when you get past your deductible, and that's basically it. That's the only reason. And mm-hmm. when you look at something like North Carolina and how the time in 1993 would have been run by quote unquote conservatives would have been a conserv considered to be a conservative state mm. you know it's almost like oh so you let this happen you, you i mean you there were probably people championing him probably giving him a standing cool. ovation for this and look where you are today <laughs> where you let you, you look where you let it get to today because as soon as you start giving up your liberties even something as stupid as seatbelt laws you're just going to keep going Especially mm. if you cheer them. Well, so you, yeah. As we will get into throughout this article, it becomes very obvious that once the priorities shift, especially from ideals, you end up with a situation whereby so many things that would be would constitute normal policing just become passed to the wayside as if they are no longer important anymore. <clears throat> so I continue on. Of course, because the the governor must, as you're sort of highlighting, you know, he has to make it into a, a media op. It has to be a press operation. There has to be rhetoric about it. You know, there is so much effort that has gone into that that could maybe go into other things like handling serious crimes. Maybe anyway. Governor Hunt's grandstanding might be harmless enough were it not for certain other facts about certain other crimes in North Carolina that also sometimes make the news. Only a week before the apprehension and public humiliation of Mr Sanders, the same newspaper reported on the state's prison crisis. It seems that North Carolina has another new law in addition to one on seatbelts. This other law, passed by the General Assembly, imposes a cap on how many inmates can be incarcerated in the state prison. And the crisis is that, under this cap, most of the inmates now eligible for ro- for parole were in prison for violent and assaultive crimes. Most of the less dangerous criminals have already been turned loose, and now the prison system must release public enemies even more dangerous than drivers who do not buckle their seatbelts. Hmm. Might be an inconvenience. Most of the less dangerous criminals have... Oh, sorry. Uh... Yes, including one of the men now charged with the murder of Michael Doher. Sorry, I'm getting all lost where I'm here. I'm sorry for that. Since last June. Yeah, sorry. Since last June, no less than 14 parolees, including one of the men now charged with the murder of Michael Jordan's father, have been arrested and charged with murder, and another parolee, a veteran of the state's death row, murdered his girlfriend and then committed suicide, thereby unfairly depriving Governor Hunt of yet another photo op. <laughs> Last August alone, North Carolina paroled 3,700 prison inmates. One might think of the governor of the state and 150 police officers and state troopers who took time out of their public jobs to listen to him slap himself in the back for busting poor Mr Sanders were really interested in upholding their oaths of office. They might turn their attention to the results of releasing hardened and violent criminals who have already been caught, sentenced and imprisoned. <clears throat> what do you expect in a bureaucracy? No, it's, a bureaucracy is just 
exactly. When when you have checkbooks and accounting and boxes to fill, you do not end up with a functioning system of law. You have a functioning system of bureaucracy, and even within that, very rarely does it ever work. <laughs> And there's also something else to remember about North Carolina is North Carolina is known as a college, I mean, University of North Carolina, Duke. It's mm-hmm. got many colleges. And this is 1993. Um, Kaczynski's manifesto came out in 95. Mm-hmm. This is the kind of stuff he's writing about. The he, political correctness has already taken over. So when you see people, violent criminals, being released from prison like they're talking about now how um i forget who it was who said they wanted to empty the prisons in you know in like five years Mm. and they're like of everyone i mean this is just what you're seeing here is the beginning of what you're seeing now of you know all those violent criminals that were released out out of Mm. chicago uh, prison um jails for um for covid like six months ago and yeah i mean this is just This is just leftist. This is all um, due to the leftist. I mean, 1993, people think, oh, it wasn't woke then. Oh, believe me. Mm. What Kaczynski was writing about in his manifesto when he was talking about, you know, um, how terrible the left was and how they were always looking for causes. Mm one of them this i guarantee you this was this came from the left it's a funny coincidence that a lot of the states and counties that went with the policy of releasing prisoners in early 2020 also saw a a rapid increase in riots and disorder during the summer of that year i I can't you know causation is not correlation blah 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 you know but it seems a bit coincidental to me at least (laughs) It does. That doesn't seem like it would have anything to do with it. No. <laughs> it must be. It must be a conspiracy theory that if you release criminals on the street, they cause more crime. <laughs> anyway, but the saga of the Napoleon of crime and the homely person of B. W. Sanders is not an isolated incident. It is a representative tale that illustrates what I take to be an entirely new form of government, one that, as far as I can tell, is unique in human history and unknown to political theory, ancient or modern. Probably no other society has failed as dismally as the United States in the late 20th century to meet the basic test of any civilization, to enforce a simple order and protect the lives and property of its members. History knows of many societies that have succumbed to anarchy when the central government proved unable to control warlords, rebels and marauding invaders. But anarchy is not quite the problem here. I mean, you could just think of Somalia right off the bat. I mean, just if the central government proves to be unable to... Well, I mean, uh, I don't know. It's Anarchy isn't the problem. They're still... Who are you thinking? I was going to actually say that what he's he's talking about there is the the sort of breakdown of these sort of Byzantine structures. I mean, I've got... And the notes here, I don't know if you caught them. You know, there was some... This sort of policing by numbers is how almost all of the British public services were run during, I want to say, from the early 90s right through to the 2000s. And you had this sort of, you know, you had these these structures around things like the National Health Service, so that the total numbers of people coming in and out, in the same way that, you know, the prison system, the total numbers of people coming in and out become the focus. And the the punishment and the reform aspect of the prison now takes a backseat to getting people in and out. And you had the same issue over here with the NHS. It became about wait times at A&E and getting people in and out. Actually providing healthcare for people was a secondary aspect to having the revolving door of people flowing in and out of the thing. You know, it becomes very strange that the the institution just becomes a a churning machine. It doesn't actually perform its original function anymore. And I I don't uh, know. If Somalia the... was Somalia was wrong on my part. Um, reading this, um, if you wanted to point to, you can look at certain sections of the United States right now that are basically um, because of the because of central government bre- breakdown or central government policy of just. Re- that revolving door and just sending out checks and stuff like that. You can look at places like Cam- Camden, New Jersey, and the South Side of Chicago, um, places like that. That uh, you know, 
hmm. were I'm not going to say they were completely caused by government you know by that government efficiency that good government efficiency whatever hmm. they want to call it um oh it's really not but um because of because really once you're once so much resources are flowing into one area some resources are going to have to be denied it hmm. well there's the thing that a lot of people are not capable of is disaggregating the type of order that's being imposed and the mechanism used to impose the order you know these are two sort of separate aspects you know the you could you could have a system of order that is like a theocracy but if it's a theocracy by government it will look entirely different than a theocracy by royalty or monarchy or you know some form of like highly closed off senate or something like that you know these things will not look the same because they do not function the same and i mean i, I don't know if it's an aspect of federalism that allowed the United States to have varying approaches to, you know, these sort of these reforms of crime bills and you know this sort of notion of these seatbelt laws and whatever else. Whereas in Britain again with a national structure, you had Blair in the two thousands who didn't actually have to change his methods because, you know, if you if you change your methods in one place, you can then compare it to somewhere else. And if your methods have changed for better or worse, then that creates issues back and forth, and especially if you're all meant to work together as you know these different police institutions across the nation, then it creates sort of tensions. So they just decided to change the way they measured the statistics. They just made it look like there was less crime by lying, <laughs> which I always thought was just it's it's so blatant. You know, you just you you forget whether or not people measure crime by what they see in front of them and then they measure it by what they're told the crime is. I mean, that's, I think, what Francis is trying to get at here. You know, the governor sees it as more important to tell you there's no crime than to actually make sure there is no crime. Oh, oh you are right about federalism having a um, having a part in that is that um, that's why, like, the place the place I live in can be so different than like a Chicago or Camden, New Jersey or something like that. Mm. Um, but it, it also, you know, you got to remember the smaller you get, um, the easier it is to maintain. Mm. Um, yeah. It, it's, you know, people talk about, Oh, how can, how can socialism work in Sweden? And we know so Sweden isn't socialist, but mm. just pretending that they are, it's like, well, 11 million people versus 330 million people. Um, yeah, you know, and a homogenous and a homogenous culture. So I mean, it's just I don't know yeah, if it's Sweden different. anymore. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, yeah, but the um, and they're a cult anyway. That's what Tim Pool told me. I asked Tim Pool what Sweden was like. He goes, "It's a cult." <laughs> <laughs> I can I can kind of imagine that actually. Swedish people are always yeah. really weird. I've only known one and worked with one, and they were an utter pain in the arse. And I would never work with another Swedish person ever again. <clears throat> anyway, move on. Mm, this condi this condition, which in some of my columns I've called anarcho tyranny, is essentially a kind of Hegelian synthesis of what appears, or, sorry, of what appears to be dialectical opposites. Thank you. I, I think did you skip a um a paragraph? Oh, sorry, did we? The United uh, States today, the government performs. Uh, I was yeah. I, was, I thought if we if we end up going through the whole thing, we might be here for a while. Okay, yeah, go ahead, go ahead, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Then do do what you do. Yeah, sorry. No, just uh, I'm just making sure I've not missed anything. That other one, I think it's just a general sort of point. Yeah, yeah. It it just it, it just sums up basically what we just said. So, mm. on, anyway. I apologize. Uh, the combination of oppressive government power against the innocent and the law abiding, and simultaneously a grotesque paralysis of the ability or the will to use power to carry out basic public duties such as protection or public safety. <coughs> what? <clears throat> 
and it is characteristic of anarcho-tyranny that it not only fails to punish criminals and enforce legitimate order, but also criminalises the innocent. At the same time, the governor of North Carolina grotesquely fails to uphold his famous oath to protect the citizens of his state by keeping convicted felons in prison. He has no problem finding the time to organise a massive waste of his time and the taxpayer's money to hound and humiliate a perfectly innocent citizen for the infraction of a trivial traffic law. In fact, we criminalise the innocent all the time in the United States today, through asset seizure laws that confiscate your property even before you're convicted of possessing illegal drugs, through mandatory brainwashing programmes designed to reconstruct your mind with sensitivity training, human relations and rehabilitation if you display politically incorrect ideas on certain occasions. I mean, not to cut the paragraph in half, but I have been chipping my way through you and Aaron going through Ted's manifesto and as you're saying these aren't far off the same time it's it's amazing how prescient and how much of this people like Francis saw so early on yeah, yeah it was um... <sighs> takes a certain kind of person to look and see what was see what was happening and um, kind of people who actually see trends like this early usually end up becoming outcasts and, um, you know, mm. get yelled at. You get yelled at if you decide you want to um, maybe do a podcast on them. Mm, you want to stir the pot before people have really realized what's in it. <laughs> well, why would, you, why would you want to associate yourself with these people? Well, I mean... <laughs> Some of them are prophets. Don't you know Sam Francis has been denounced by the SPLC? You, you can't talk about him. I know. Well, it's all right. Through prosecuting people like Bernard Goetz, who use guns to defend themselves, and through gun controls in general. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I'm on to the right bit there. Uh, gun control. Under anarcho-tyranny, gun control laws do not usually target criminals who use guns to commit their crimes. The usual suspects are non-criminals who own, carry, or use guns against criminals, like the Korean store owners in Los Angeles, or like Mr. Goetz, Goetz however you want to pronounce that, who spent several months in jail after picking off the three hoodlums who were ready to liberate him from life and limb. I mean, I think there's... There is a, a grander point to be made there, and the way that Francis talks about managerialism in some of his bigger works because he sort of he goes into gun laws but doesn't necessarily explain why there are gun laws and it is that sort of attitude of micromanaging and sort of try to socially engineer every aspect of society you know every pebble every person every footstep you then try to instead of legislating for you know these moral values like good and evil and justice you try and legislate specific material items in and out of acceptability which is normal to us nowadays but if you tried to explain to someone in the 17th century that you want to take longbows from the hands of criminals they would look at you as if you were insane I don't, know if, I don't know if you find that's a similar thing when thinking about it. Yeah, well, you know, it, it really is. They're worried about, they know that the law-abiding gun owner is more of a threat to their power than the guy doing drive-bys in L.A. or the south, south side of Chicago. Mm. Guy... The guy on the the guys in L.A. and this uh, on the south side of Chicago, they actually um, confirm the fact that they that the government needs to exist and the government needs to have all this power. Mm. Well, they... the the law abiding gun owner doesn't doesn't commit crimes with their gun, so they have to find crimes, you know, for the gun owner. Like mm. you know, if you if you have a rifle, if you have an AR fifteen. The barrel is less than is less than sixteen uh, inches. I am really sorry. I'm gonna have to jump out for a second. Okay.
Oh, hey, Charles. How you doing? Um, well, shit, why not? Um, so these stupid gun laws, I mean, if you have a gun that just takes you is a half inch less than a rifle, an AR-15 that's like 15 and a half inches, you're going to do 10 years in, in federal prison. It's designed that way because they have to turn everyone into a criminal. It's the, you know, the easiest way to um, control the population. It also keeps you guessing. Uh, you live in a tyranny of laws. Um, there's there's no way that anyone, even somebody working for the ATF, working for the NFA, know all of the gun laws. Hmm. So you get to the you get to the point where it's like, and you know, my my fiance is a public def was a public defender, and you know she knows this this um, phrase better than I do. Well, ignorance of the law is no excuse. And they you can say oh well i mean i just don't know i didn't know that that was illegal it's like well that doesn't matter what's well, as a basic I mean, sort of set of incentives to weigh up do you spend your time going after ever increasingly more dangerous and sneaky criminals or do you just make more people more criminals so you can bump your numbers up more and then funnily enough you actually have then easier and softer targets to go after yeah, and that's exactly it. If you go to crack down on on um, gangbangers in the south side of Chicago, they're going to shoot back at the police. You go to you go to crack down on law abiding gun owners in the burbs. They're they know that there is not a chance that you're going to shoot back, and they still kill some of of them. You know, especially with their four a.m. raids. Look at Duncan Lemp, mm. and they just shoot him through the friggin' window, shoot him from the outside of the house, laying in bed. It's just yeah it, it does create soft targets but in order for them to grow their power they have to criminalize everyone and mm -hmm. you know there is a book called three three felonies a day that basically shows that even the most law-abiding right-winger you know, who you know conservative who boomer con who loves his you know loves his flag and loves to pledge is committing th on average three felonies a day and he doesn't even know it that's the way the system is designed. They have to keep it that way. Hmm. Shall we continue? <clears throat> Indeed, the government response to crime is by far the best illustration of anarcho-tyranny. On the one hand, police forces are better equipped, better trained and more expensive than ever before in history. Police routinely use computers, have access to nationwide information banks and carry weapons and communication gadgets that most tyrants of the past would drool over. I love that phrase. I use that so often I don't even realise where it comes from sometimes. <laughs> Yet the police seem utterly baffled by the murder rate. None of their high-tech whiz-bang helps much <laughs> catch serious criminals after they have struck, to stop them before they strike or to keep them off the streets after they are caught. But while the police cannot do much about murderers, rapists and robbers, they are geniuses at nabbing less serious lawbreakers. They can crack down on tax dodgers, speeders, jaywalkers and pornography patrons, seatbelt non-bucklers and epithet emitters, gun owners and graffiti scratchers. I mean, not to sort of branch off in a massive big point, but to me it has always been obvious that the implementation of technology into any system as always argued as efficiency and I've just started to see the word efficiency as a cope for them telling you that the system no longer does what it was supposed to before it just does something else a lot quicker the end of the manifesto when Ted goes back to talking about the left he says that when you're looking for people to join the revolution against technology don't want leftists because mm. leftists are going to they desire power and in order for them to get power they're going to use technology so it, it's very interesting that at the end of the manifesto he's actually saying you're not going to be recruiting leftists yeah. and you know talking about talking about how police use technology here and everything i mean it's a it's a perfect a perfect example of um how technology introduced into any system <clears throat> is going to not only expand the system, but it's going to strengthen the system. Hmm. Uh, I don't know, maybe we should get into it now before we continue on. I don't know if we will get the article finished or not. We'll just sort of chip away as much as we can. But the, uh, the sort of 
point that I, I want to stress is that law and order as a value in and of itself, you know, in the same way that the Constitution is a value in and of itself, separated from God, is a useless sort of materialist thing that can really be framed in whatever way you want. And you can really get whatever you want out of it as long as you are the people who get to decide, well, this is what the Constitution represents, or this is what law and order represents. So, you know, as it's stated at the start, it is argued as appealing to law and order that this governor will come out and create this massive press up over a $25 ticket. And that ultimately people get fooled into still believing that that is the correct order. Because they still in their heads believe in law and order as a, a higher goal, not just a material goal, but something that should be strived to and that is an integral part of justice, not a managerial solution to problems that involve wide-scale social engineering and don't really give you what you're wanting for out of it. And it becomes very easy to just use law and order as a sort of ideological shorthand for this is good <laughs> and disorder is what is not good when you when you talk to police um that's what you find out you find out that they they just think that law means good and that breaking the law means bad mm. and um i like to point out to them that most of those laws because most police eh, most police especially in smaller towns are mostly right wingers i like to point out to them that all those laws that they're that they love so much were written by leftists. Hmm. That's what I mean. The, or, or, the law and order becomes a leftist value set. I mean, that that is why it becomes so. You know, this this notion of it being anarcho tyranny is so contradictory. Is because you are imposing a value set, but it's an entirely incorrect value set for the order that we want out of the system. And it, it's it's no wonder that it looks so out of place and juxtaposing against itself as we try and you know work our way around it <laughs> oh. um why don't you um skip the next paragraph and go to one example of a victim yeah if you can uh <clears throat> one example of an arco tyranny is a man named keith jacobson an er elderly farmer and school bus driver in nebraska Mr. Jacobson has a sexual fixation on children, and while that constitutes a sexual perversion, he says he has never satisfied his fixation by having sex with a child. He should have kept his fucking mouth shut. And indeed, prior to 1987, he had never been arrested at all. However, he does like to peruse pornography that depicts children engaged in sexual poses and activities. And when in 1987 he received in the mail some solicitations to purchase some of this smut, he ordered it. Eventually, this material arrived and he went to the local post office to pick it up. When he returned to his farm, he found two federal postal inspectors waiting for him. They promptly arrested him and charged him with violating federal statutes forbidding the purchase of child pornography through the mail. It turned out that the material he had bought had in fact been produced by the postal service itself and sent through the mail by postal service in an undercover sting operation conducted by the postal service. For some years, postal inspectors had devoted their energies to ferreting out Mr. Jacobson's perverse habits, encouraging them then, sorry, encouraging them, and then finally pouncing on him. Sorry, finally pouncing on him. As a result, Mr. Jacobson lost his farm to pay for his legal defence. He lost his job as a school bus driver, and he lost all his friends and standing in his small community when his sexual habits came to light. Eventually, the Supreme Court exonerated him, but in the meanwhile, his life had been totally ruined. I actually wasn't aware of that example until I'd read the article the first time around. It's so bizarre. The the postal service becoming its own criminal uh, fighting network. It's, <laughs> it's and, and can we just um like step back for a second and say that like if you asked like a Hoppian or a right winger to read this and didn't tell them who wrote it, they might get to this point and think that a Lalbert wrote this. Hmm. Because it seems like he's defending. Yeah. Oh, why would you defend a child? Somebody who's, uh, you know, somebody who's obviously a pedophile and everything like that. I, I just think that it's, it's funny that like Sam would choose this as an example to include. 
Because nowadays, I mean, writing this back then, there may be a little more critical thinking and a little more nuance in reading mm. that paragraph. But nowadays, somebody would just assume that, oh, no, the, the po- I mean, and I'm talking about like libertarians even would mm. be like, no, I think the Postal Service did, w- did a good thing in doing this. Well, he's, there is a point he is working towards there. You know, yeah. <clears throat> the rationale for the harassment and entrapment of Keith Jacobson was that, ch- that child pornography, illegal under federal law, is often produced in foreign countries like Denmark or Mexico, and that the law cannot reach those who produce it and who often kidnap or seduce children into taking part in it. Therefore, law enforcement has to concentrate on the consumers of child pornography rather than on its producers in order to deter the trade. This is, of course, a transparent sophism. <laughs> Uh, I mean, it, it's like it. It's like in prohibition, if they, well, I mean, they do it now with mm. weed. I mean, you in places where weed isn't legal or decriminalized yet, they concentrate more on people using it than they do on the people who are supplying it. Mm. I mean, it's just one of those, just one of those things. You know, it's like, um, you know, the during prohibition, the Chicago police would have no problem going into a um, going into a speakeasy and arresting everybody who was in there who was drinking, but no one was going after Capone. Mm. Well, that's the, the the obvious case for all of those. Is as you're saying, is is illicit materials cases of all stripes. You know, especially when it comes to drug possession laws. I mean, it's just absurd. I think is that the the whole three strike system that they have in America, whereby if you are caught with any quantity of illicit substances on you, in I think is it not all states but some states, you can do a life sentence. So you can like get caught with a gram of weed on you three times, and that's it. It's life. They had. Are you familiar with ten twenty life laws? Not overly no. So- so some states um i know florida had it i don't know if they still had it but i lived in florida for a long time Hmm. so if you pull a gun in the commission of a what they call a felony it's 10 years automatically if you fire the gun it's 20 years automatically Hmm. if the person if you if you shoot the person it's life automatically and that's just the way that they chose to dealt with that you deal with that you know and it's one of those things when when i think of laws people are like well if you ever got on a jury and it was if you ever got on a jury and it was weed or something like that i'm like yeah i'm just gonna nullify the jury and say not guilty they're like well what if it was murder and i'm like it would have to be really clear but then you ask yourself is the punishment fitting the crime i mean i mean how do you who judges that yeah, I mean, there's there is also the the issue of backlash that you get within, for example, drug dealing communities. Now the incentive is not to leave witnesses. You know, instead of threatening someone with a pistol and then running away, or shooting them in the leg and running away, you'll do twenty years for that. So you might as well kill them. <laughs> you know, it's it's such a and they can't. Well, they they can't um, testify against you. Mm, no, exactly. That's what I mean. Leave no witnesses. <laughs> oh, right. In my view, there is every reason for the federal government to ban the import of child pornography into the United States, instead of, of course, the federal government for some reason being the organisation that requires or possibly even creates child pornography to entrap people. To ban- I mean, Snowden. Snowden showed with the the playpen case five or six years ago that the FBI took over some website that um, was distributing child porn mm. and he took it over and like ran it for yep. a while. And it's like, okay, well, I mean, obviously they, and that's just another one of those cases where they were not trying to arrest the people who were supplying the website with child porn. They were trying to arrest the people who were buying it. Hmm. Another, you know, another, as Sam called it, a sophism. Yep, no, but I don't have anything else really to add to that other than we all know what's <laughs> happening with Epstein and Mossad. Yeah, yeah, yeah go ahead. <laughs> right. 
and to prohibit sending it through the mail, but the target of the law should be, and originally was supposed to be, those who produce it and distribute it for profit. What, well, as opposed to, they, they, what, they're not going to arrest people who distribute child pornography for free? <laughs> uh, as well as those who kidnap, trade in, or seduce children. It is those individuals who cause the social evil of child pornography, not casual consumers of it. Mmm, I don't know if I necessarily agree with that let alone those who buy it only because the federal government has enticed them into buying it, as Mr Jacobson did. And if the producers are ordinarily beyond the reach of laws, it does not follow that law-abiding citizens like Jacob should be target- it's Jacobson sorry, should be targeted, persecuted and ruined. The Jacobson case is particularly important in a way it was a kind of prototype for latter cases of David Koresh and Randy Weaver, and it may reflect a deliberate strategy by which admittedly bizarre people are selected for persecution. I think that's that's got to be, he's got more stuff there, but that's got to be the main point there. You know, first they mm. came for the paedophiles and the white separatists, and I did not speak out, and so on and so forth. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, uh, and they always, they always use, when it came to Koresh, and especially when it came to Koresh, they started with a new, um, they had a new meme new trope that they used Mm. is um he's hurting his own people so you know koresh was hurting his own people saddam hussein was hurting his own people assad is hurting his own people and um so yeah they learned from koresh and just kept uh using that excuse over and over again Mm. uh i'm just trying to work out where i wanted to go from after this <clears throat> Indeed, the entrapment and destruction of Keith Jacobson is, a tip- is typical of anarcho-tyranny, having passed a law that is virtually unenforceable against those who it was ostensibly intended to reach. Government turns its efforts against those it was not intended to punish, which means the law abiding. If you cannot or will not punish the criminal, criminalise and punish the innocent, and then boast of how you are being tough on crooks. I mean, as a... Not to, again, to keep breaking up paragraphs, but there was a point I had put in the notes that I mentioned previously, but this is, you know, that's an extremely succinct way to talk about the monopoly of justice and violence in the way that Rothbard and Hopper would. You know, this sort of notion that if you're the one who gets to define what justice and security is, then just go and arrest people that aren't really causing a problem and charge more money for it as you go, because no one can say no. <laughs> Uh, yeah, if you're if you're not willing to take down the real criminals, you're going to have to find people to take down soft mm. targets. And like I said before, um, if you're not taking out the real criminals, that just causes more chaos. And the more chaos is, the more that you're justifying your existence and um, your expansion of power. Exactly. <clears throat> The same dynamic of anarcho-tyranny is evident in the notorious asset seizure laws. There are a number of cases on record of homeowners or owners of planes or boats who have lost their property because small amounts of drugs, often nothing more than marijuana, were found in or on them. Often because an employee, guest or family member rather than the actual owner had possession of the drug. These are case, uh, these cases are bad enough in themselves, but the most notorious, which was which has received virtually no attention in the national press, as far as I know, except for a column by Paul Craig Roberts, concerns Donald Scott of Malibu. Perhaps the case is better known in California than it is in the rest of the country, but Mr Scott's victimisation by narco tyranny caused him to pay an even higher price than Randy Weaver or David Koresh or Keith Jacobson. I mean, I, I think I might just summarise the story in short. Uh, a 30 man, yeah, thirty man raiding party breaks into a, you know, a several million dollar house that this man owns under the auspices that his wife was taking drugs and she wasn't but the, of course these these this Mr Scott his house has just been broken into and he's here boots run about and glass smashing decides he's going to grab his rifle and defend himself as you do you know when your survival instincts kick in because you're human and then he gets shot to pieces and of course because the operatives of the state are by virtue allowed to take advantage of the monopoly privileges that the state has, it then just becomes a self-defence case. And the people who, as the article says, the murderers of Mr Scott pled self-defence and were let off. You know, I doubt I doubt there was the same tension around that trial in the way that there was maybe around, say, like the Rittenhouse trial, which was arguably a much more clear-cut 
and justifiable case of one-on-one self-defense. I mean, could you even... I don't even know if I would refer to the state shooting someone whose house they'd broken into as self-defense. No. No, I mean, it's... They're they're robbers. They're home invaders. Mm. I mean, it's... I had said a long time ago that these SWAT raids and everything need to end because if I put together a home invasion team, I'm going to take a door down and go in. First, my first thought is to just scream police. DEA, DEA. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's especially if they're, you know, quote unquote law abiding, if they're quote unquote law abiding citizens, what are they going to do? And I mean, mm. you're really. I mean, if you're doing a home invasion, sure, maybe you're going to rob a drug dealer or something. But, I mean, you're probably going to go after a soft target. And if they're law-abiding citizens, as soon as they hear police, they are going to you know, drop their guard. Mm. And then you, ha- then you have them. And that's why these, I mean, these home invasions that these cops do, I mean, they don't. Man. I mean, I know personally someone who had this happen, and you know, they shot his, they shot and killed his dog, and everything like that, and um, they spent years in, you know, years in prison, and it was drugs, just drugs. Mm. I mean. <clears throat> but no, it's it's very obvious that ethics and values and morals and philosophy, all these things that we are told justify laws and law enforcement have absolutely nothing to do with it. It is a, on the ground level, it is a pure power play by people who, quite frankly, just act like a mafia or like a gang. <laughs> you know, I think what's the, the joke is what separates uh, organised crime and police officers is the badge and the uniform. I mean, they don't. They have rights that other people don't. There's a, a different class. Different set of there's privileges. A <laughs> there's a caste system in the United States. People don't want to accept it. Mm. <clears throat> Again, as with federal child pornography statutes, there should be no problem with laws that include as punishment for dealing the drug, or sorry, for drug dealing, the confiscation of property or assets. But under some of the asset seizure laws, property can be confiscated prior to conviction and often with little attention to the actual or serious guilt of the property owner. And they are brought, sorry, and they are virtual bottomless pits by which law enforcement agencies can essentially steal private property to bolster their own budgets. As with other anarcho tyrannical measures, real drug dealers who often contrive to hide their assets are frequently not affected. The law falls mainly on law abiding citizens. I mean, here, as a, a direct example of that same issue of, sort of backlash, you enforce all these measures to confiscate the property of drug dealers, and you force drug dealers to then operate through even more decentralized and diffuse networks. You know, further creating a larger problem, which at some point they will then have to impose more measures to try and solve. Well, it's like um, it's like Bob Murphy says don't see apply the two appliance companies in this country um best buy and brand smart you don't see them doing drive-bys on each other mm, maybe that's the issue <laughs> uh, yeah I, um between those two i probably prefer best buy so i'll probably i'll, I'll probably be team best buy um yeah i'm gonna be getting like my aldi like headband and going and shooting people <laughs> as they walk into the little or something uh, that's Ger- the German company. Got to be careful. Edwin's Law and all. Nineteen ninety three all <laughs> over again. <laughs> yeah, probably the most common example of anarcho tyranny in practice are gun control laws. And as you know, there is no, now a concerted effort across the country to abolish private gun o- ownership entirely. That goal used to be a kind of hidden agenda of the gun control lobby, and every nutty gun control measure that was introduced was accompanied by sneering denials that it would would go any further. But in recent years, the agenda has come out of the closet. Congress Major Owens of New York actually introduced a constitutional amendment last year to repeal the Second Amendment. And before he did so, Conservative columnist George Will had already endorsed its repeal. This is perhaps the first time in history that a congressman has proposed repealing part of the Bill of Rights. 
Mr. Wynne says the Second Amendment is not needed in the United States today. And Mr. Well argues that what he calls police saturation will provide an adequate substitute for the private security offered by guns. Police saturation, or as Mr. Well describes it, a policeman in every corner is of course a euphemism for a police state. And it is entirely characteristic of Mr. Well's brand of fascism properly understood. <laughs> I mean, I've been to a place where there was a policeman on every corner, um, every other corner. Um, before COVID, in New York City was basically safe. Mm. Manhattan, all the tourist areas were basically safe because there was li- there were literally police on every single corner. Mm. Most people don't know this about New York, but before COVID, they had about 44,000 police officers. And just let that settle in. Forty four thousand. And that's like eighty percent, eighty five percent of Yankee Stadium. Mm. And that's for New York. I and even... it was an absolute police state. I, I, and, I can imagine. I mean it's just it's wild when you're especially during the holidays, you go up there go during Christmas. I mean you you could not walk a block without seeing a cop Mm. so no i know that even in my rather short stint on this earth so far i have watched especially travel hubs train stations and bus stations are swarmed nowadays in britain and even places that you wouldn't expect them to you know fully armed officers you know not even just a pistol holstered but like you know holding some form of assault rifle or an SMG you know that is not something I am used to at all especially coming down to England and areas like Manchester you know it's so ridiculous now they are so supposedly security focused that we we don't even have bins in our train stations anymore because they're they're so terrified of bomb threats (laughs) It's just insane. Yeah, I never saw a police officer carrying a um, a quote unquote assault rifle until I went to Europe. Mm. The first time I went to, um, I think the first place I saw it was Vienna. Second place I saw it was in Bucharest. Mm. And yeah, that was kind of was kind of over the top, you know. Especially when you're like, I mean, this is. Isn't it supposed to be safer here than in the United States? I mean, the United States is supposed to be like the Wild West, right? Mm. Well, it's, <laughs> it always it reminds the paragraph itself. It just reminds me of the way it's framed in Hopper. You know, who would want to be protected by someone who required of him as a first step to give up his ultimate means of self-defense? But it's yeah. it's it's insane that you would get into any private dealing with someone and the, the first thing they would demand is that you rescind your ability to hold them accountable before you engage in any agreement. Well, still have guns here for now, but the thing is, is that, and you know what's funny is people um, talk about Australia and it's like, oh, if they didn't, see, Australia gave up their guns and it's like, Australians didn't give up their guns bunch of them did but there's more guns in australia right now than there were before the buyback before the quote-unquote buyback mm. the fact is they just don't use they're not going to use them like they're like no one here is going to use them they're just not <laughs> just just be you know, just be glad you don't live in the uk that i mean i don't know how aware you are of how the laws work in britain at all but if you if you have a gun license, that is cause for any officer of the law to visit your property and inspect every aspect of it at any moment when they feel the need to. No warning given, no mention whatsoever, just a knock at the door, we're coming in to make sure your weapons and everything else is all in order. <laughs> well, the um, in the United States, if you decide that you want to play the game of having suppressors or short-barreled rifles 
have to register and pay a tax with the national with the NFA, which is the National Firearms Act. It's a uh, division of the ATF uh, alcohol, tobacco, and firearms here. Mm. And you actually, mm-hmm. if you have anything in the NFA and it's registered, same thing. Mm. You can come in and inspect anytime. Yeah, I think after the was it Southampton where the the last quote unquote incel shooter ran wild, there mm. were a number of people across Britain who had all of their weapons taken off of them, their social medias were checked, and then they never got their weapons back. <laughs> you know, it's it, it couldn't be more obvious that they are very clearly trying to weaken and rid the self-defence of an ideological group they see as their enemy. I mean, it, there is no other reason for why they would do that. And, you know, when it comes right down to it, you know, if people in the, if people in the United States aren't willing to go and use them, how you know, are people in Britain going to use them if things get too bad? You, you I don't know. That's hear. a good question. I mean, self-defense here is even worse than it is in the U.S. Sure. I mean, I understand the sort of issues that no, no matter what the situation is, if someone dies on your property, there's always a case around it. But in Britain, even in popular media, more often than not, you will see sympathy. For example, I think the, the last case I remember of it was, it was one in 2019, where someone had broken into an older man's house and between kitchen implements or some form of tools in one of his cupboards, he'd stabbed the man to death because he broke into his home and probably threatened him with a weapon too. It, it, it then became a whole sort of national, you know, a whole sort of national press operation around honouring this young you know, multiple repeat criminal in and out of prison constantly, effectively scumbag, who'd broken into an old man's home in the middle of the night and then got himself stabbed to death. He became the victim there, which is, is such a... It's just such an evil thing to do. I can, I can think of no other word for it. Yeah. I mean, I, I actually think I read that and somebody had shared it with me. Mm. Just insane. It's absolutely insane. Right, shall I try and continue and get as much of this done as we can? <clears throat> the fact is that the police and the criminal justice system do not offer protection, nor can they. We have too many policemen in this country already to go back to rally for a moment where the governor is so zealous about his oath to protect the citizens. I recall that when I happened to visit the city some months ago, there had been a serious car accident in the middle of the afternoon that tied up local traffic for hours. I rode by the site of the accident around 8 o'clock that night, and even though there was no congestion at all, even though the vehicles involved had long since been removed and whatever people were injured had long since been taken to hospital, there were five police vehicles and five policemen still on the scene. It is not at all uncommon in this country to see speed traps, sobriety checks, etc. that take up to fa- t- sorry, that take the time of five or six more policemen for several hours. In Washington, uh, I'm sorry, in Washington, it is a regular feature of the morning rush hour from Northern Virginia to see several local policemen wandering around in traffic in the middle of Route 9, 395, just before you reach the 14th Street, Street Bridge for the purpose of pulling over drivers who are driving on the shoulders of the road. As long as the police can afford to assign personnel to these trivial functions or to s- such perennial aggravations as parking enforcement at a time when urban crime rates are higher than ever, there is no reason to talk about the need for yet more policemen, nor is there any reason to call in the National Guard, the Special Forces, forces or Boutros Boutros and his blue helmets to do the job civilian authorities are refused to do. God, I always forget about Boutros Boutros Galley. No one mentions him anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I think that there is a there is a great point there. I mean, it reminds me again of the Hopper essay that is written as a response to Stephen Pinker, when Pinker talks about you know progress from the the birth of the state through to the modern day, and he uses the examples of things like law and order and modern policing as these bastions of progress you know these are the cornerstones of social democratic society which is of course utopia and that despite that 
the more and more police officers we have, we seem to have more and more crime. I mean, you can just get up graphs for UK crime rates, and especially if you adjust for the statistical manipulation that happened during Blair's era, you can see that, you'd say from the 1950s through to today, crime on average per person has increased almost exponentially, and at the same time, the number of police officers per person has probably done the exact same. And it's, you know, everything they tell us about how it's supposed to work would indicate that that would be the last relationship you would expect from that. That, you know, the, the, the more law enforcement there is, the more crime there is. But as we have sort of begun to identify, and as Sam Francis is describing in this article, the introduction of more and more police officers is generally a sign of the fact that some other previous law enforcement measure has now caused more problems than there were before. So now they need to plug the hole. And I mean, the more, more officers you have, the more laws you have, the more people there are to arrest. It's, it's, I mean, this is blackpilling as hell. Mm. But the thing is, it's not even just in the sense of you know the petty crimes and small tickets that they're talking about. You know, and that that press up earlier in the article that are the examples of crime. You can relate it directly to you know serious violent crime. As the number of police officers go up, the number of serious violent offenders seems to go up even higher. It's just. We shall we shall continue. We shall not become too yeah, black filled. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But... In any case, the policemen we already have seem to spend an inordinate amount of time of their an inordinate amount of their time enforcing law against the marginal lawbreaker and avoiding avoiding enforcement against serious criminals. This became a national scandal in the LA riots when police actually arrested store owners who were carrying weapons to protect themselves against the rioters while carefully avoiding confrontations with rioters and at least one case even passed by a store that was being looted. I mean, maybe maybe it's, it's a case of Francis not wanting to write the world's longest article, but you know, we we know we know why they do this now. You know, they don't confront the rioters because ideologically, that's not their job anymore. Their job is not to enforce order on BLM. Their job is to enforce the order that BLM wants or that we are told BLM wants. Yeah, uh, I mean that's the way it. Um... <sighs> seems that the the lunatics are running the asylum now mm. yeah. and they're you know and just as the police come for the um soft targets you know, those people like blm and the ideologues come for us mm. Ugh, right in Virginia, we have a recent and outstanding example of an arco tyranny at work in Governor Douglas Wilder's one gun a month law. Since last July in Virginia, it has been illegal to buy more than one handgun a month on the reasoning offered by the BATF that more than 40% of the guns used in crimes in New York and Washington are imported from Virginia where gun control laws are lax. The gun runner vows a BTF. BATF spokesman just fill up their trunks with firepower and hightail it up Interstate 95. One hopes they do not drive on the shoulders of the road or leave their seatbelts unbuckled. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's, That's there's, funny. A, there's another paragraph here which is sort of goes into the obvious point that you know there is not a gun crime problem in this area in Virginia. The gun crime is in New York, and the gun crime is in you know these these other regions in. You know, the, the issue is not the sale of firearms. The issue is the people in these regions, you know, but more importantly, the culture of these people. And, I mean, let's let's maybe not get into it too far with, despite making up 13% of the population jokes, but there is a reason why, as he says, you know, there are about 72 murders for every 100,000 people in the District of Columbia, but less than 8, 000, or sorry, 8 per 100,000 in the whole state of Virginia. You know, nine times the murder rate. I just, you know, I think I would get in trouble if I was to try and correlate that with other statistics. Yeah, probably best not to. 
but that it, it comes back round to the sort of the wider issues around the article. If you don't have a culture that appreciates, you know, a higher order, some some form of you know properly philosophically derived sense of justice, you just end up living in a state of disorder. And no matter how you try to police that, you either end up with dead police officers, dead gang members, or dead people in the side of the street from the shootouts. You know, it's it's, it's lose lose sort of situation for the most part. <clears throat> you want to keep going? Yeah, let's. <clears throat> well, one characteristic of anarcho tyranny is its propensity to criminalise and punish the innocent and the law abiding while refusing to punish the criminals. Another is its refusal to enforce the laws it has already enacted and to enact more laws that have no effect on real crime and that further right sorry further criminalise the innocent or restrict their right. Governor Wilder's law shows this, and it's interesting that barely two months after the law went into effect in Virginia, the BATF announced that 40% of the guns now used in Washington crimes come from Maryland, so you must have a similar law there. The logical conclusion, of course, is that there should be a United Nations Convention on Handguns, under which handguns would be outlawed everywhere in the world, with international sanctions and tribunals against the provinces of the New World Order that failed to obey and with contingents of blueberries presumably armed with handguns and guns themselves to enforce it. I suggest that General Adid and the commanders as the commander of the force. <laughs> that is that is almost, I don't know, what I could only describe as a Walter Block level of like reductio ad absurdum article, or sorry, argument. That's, I, there's no better ones going than that one in that case. <laughs> and that just, that basically comments on itself. Hmm. Go on to the next paragraph, or uh, where we jump yep. into. Yeah, I'm just sorting the thing. Sorry, just to check something. <clears throat> Colorado's new law forbidding minors from owning guns is also a recent incident of gun control anarcho tyranny. Passed this summer on the grounds that too many minors are killing each other with guns, the law merely imposes a five-day jail sentence on any minor who possesses a gun, except sometimes. Of course, no minor with a gun who is disposed to commit a crime with it is likely to be deterred by five days in jail. Most such teenagers spend a good part of their adolescence in and out of jail. The only people who will be so deterred from sorry, will be so deterred, will be otherwise law-abiding minors who carry guns to protect themselves from their not-so-law-abiding cohorts, whom their narco-tyrants do nothing to control. And that's just bull getting used to violence early. Mm. Well, I think, is it, yeah. is it Michael Malice that does the whole, you know, the only places where normal people experience violence is uh, school and prison? I... Th- yeah, and that's the he he started that out with school, and that really stuck with me. That and that was the first thing I thought of too. Reading that is that, uh, I mean, average person is going to go through their life even in a small town. Um, the only they may not the only place they may have violence inflicted upon them is in school because mm. i mean it's a government it's just a smaller version it's a scaled down version of a um the government mm. you just get all all people into this get get all these kids into this building um it's that looks like a prison yeah i mean we it's set up like a prison we obviously did not have firearms problem but in the scottish education system there is a horrendous problem with stabbings and in Scottish youth in general, I mean, there is, there is not a youth-centred institution anywhere. Sorry, pardon me. In Scotland, that doesn't have one of those, you know, no knives save lives kind of posters somewhere. You know, in the same sense of this is a gun-free zone everywhere in Scotland, where people are supposed to be is a knife-free zone, and all you do is you just teach people to hide their knives better. <laughs> You know, in the same yeah. sense, you you know, you're not stopping someone who's gonna go out and stab someone. You're stopping people who carry pen knives for tools. I mean, I've I've had run-ins with the police myself because you know we're all out skateboarding or whatever in the middle of the night in the town centre, and you get stopped and your bags get searched. 
and they pull out a screwdriver. Now, obviously, you've got tools for fixing things or taking lenses at cameras or whatever else. And they're sitting there demanding that this, you know, small screwdriver that's very obviously used as a tool because it's in a tool bag is an offensive weapon because knife then becomes this whole standard and, you know, much as you were talking about before, you then try to create these sort of types for, like, this is what a short rifle is that gets you an extra 10 years and blah, blah, blah. It becomes so sort of Byzantine in nature. Where and of course, now? what happens is, keep... I was going to say, what happens is, uh, the situation <laughs> that I always remember, uh, in secondary schools in Scotland, you will visit your secondary school during your primary school for sort of a, a few days on one of your last weeks or whatever else. But during that time period, someone gets stabbed, you know, on the school grounds. And he was stabbed with what was essentially a Sharpie pen, cored out, and had some hot glue and a blade stuck in it. <laughs> you know, it's, it, these these criminals aren't stupid. You know, they they, no. they they might not be intelligent, but they they know how to be crafty. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> yet one of my favourite examples of an arco tyranny is the crime bill that Congress considered last year. Its most notable feature was the authorisation of the death penalty for no less than 51 different crimes, so that senators could boast to their constituents of the draconian retribution they are itching to visit upon wrongdoers. That sounds really tough, but the new capital crimes include such exotic offences as genocide, treason and espionage, inflicting death on those who would protect the average citizen on the street about as much as directing traffic regulates pigeon droppings. The average housewife is usually not too worried that that Paul Pot or Julius Rosenberg will jump her when she walks through the supermarket parking lot at night. Mm. <laughs> I don't know, I'd want Paul Pot to jump me in the supermarket at night, I'll tell you that. <laughs> many of the 48 offences, or sorry, many of the other 48 offences for which the law would have executed you simply protect office holders. The bill authorised the death penalty for murdering the President, members of Congress, members of the Cabinet and the Supreme Court, court officers, relatives of a federal official for the killers of jurors, witnesses, crime victims, informants, foreign officials, state officials assisting federal officials, and specifically for the murder of officials of the US Department of Agriculture, including horse inspectors, poultry inspectors, egg inspectors, nuclear regulatory inspectors, and meat inspectors. Senators who voted for the bill did not have to worry about losing the egg inspector vote. I mean, I, when I first read that paragraph I was flashed into my mind and like some sort of scene from like Goodfellas or like you know the Godfather you know it's like the it's like the dawns like well if you hit one of my guys I'm gonna hit one of your guys it's so it's so mask off <laughs> I mean it's when you, you take into consideration that I, mean, I don't want the I don't like the only reason I don't like the death penalty is because I don't like it being handed down by the state. Mm. And because I know that the state is inefficient and you know, I follow the Innocence Project, which which gets a lot of people off of death row um, who were innocent, especially mm. before, especially like in the beginning of DNA evidence. And then you have, I mean, do, do you even trust the system? I mean, these people just want convictions and that's that's really all they want. Um, but when you read something like that, you just realize that if you can get the death penalty for, I mean, is this, what What if somebody, a meat inspector is just going home at night and someone goes to rob him and something goes wrong and unfortunately the person ends up dead? Is that a death penalty? I mean, some people would say, yeah, it should be a death penalty. It should be a death penalty. Yeah, but it's like, um, Maybe an average person who was just walking home that they tried to rob wouldn't get wouldn't um, demand the death penalty. It just really just goes to show that you're just well, you that that caste system needs to be expanded. Well, no, it's, it's exactly you know if you if you if you for some reason or another have murdered someone from that caste, you know you're not treated as a normal murderer anymore. You're treated as some ideological construct that 
as I said before, essentially constitutes you hit one of our guys, so we're gonna hit you. You know, it's like all these people who are egg inspectors and meat inspectors have become made men. Yeah, it's it, pure insanity. I mean, it's when you read stuff like that. This, especially, yeah, that he writes so well to put it together like mm. this. It really hits home. It's hard to you know read or listen to this and just be and not be floored. I mean, you really, and the sad part is there's a certain segment of the population that will hear that and be like, oh, that all makes sense to me. Mm. Sure, that's exactly what we should do. Yeah, I don't want to you know, skip through too much, but the the next point, you know, it, it talks further about some of the serious crimes in that bill that, you know, seem like things that have kind of almost a movie, and then it talks about, you know, these, some, the uh, budget for drug emergency areas, which he refers to as also known as cities, <laughs> which I just find quite mm-hmm. funny. But this, you know, the irony of local police using the proliferation of drugs, which for the most part, especially in the eighties and into the nineties, were brought in by the CIA. I mean, this is almost like a known, publicly admitted fact now that ton quantities of cocaine were brought in by the CIA month on month on month into the US to the point where we could have no idea how much was really brought in but that as this you know worked its way into the street it then became a justification for hundreds of millions of dollars if not billions of dollars of investment in local police you know it, it instigated so many of the the crimes that they then had to go out and create all these new measures and mandates for. Uh, I'll just try to work out where we could go from here. Yes, uh, other point. Yeah, one interesting thing about the bill is that it shows how Conservatives in Congress have totally abandoned the principle of federalism. One congressional staffer in a Republican office told me that the de- bill's death penalty provisions were intended to enforce the death penalty in states that refused to enact it themselves. In other words, to sneak around the principle of federalism and states' rights to force a criminal statute down the throats of unwilling states. I believe strongly in the death penalty for a number of criminal offences, and I believe every state ought to pass it and enforce it effectively, but under no circumstances should the federal government be able to force or dragoon any state into adopting the death penalty or any other criminal statute it does not want or believe in. Obviously, it was mainly Conservatives who were pushing the mega-death bill, so let us endure no more sermons from these Solons about judicial activism or their other violations of federalism when those violations tread on local interests that are politically important to the lawmakers. Having surrendered the Federalist and states' rights principles, they cannot expect those principles to be respected by others who have more uses for the federal leviathan than turning into an oversized gas chamber. I mean, that's... You know, it directly reflects the thing we were talking about before. You know, law and order, enforcing the death penalty as is proper as I'd imagine what the rhetoric was at the time, then became an avenue for federal government imperialism. I mean, it's just every time the government wages war, they come out with more federal power, with more power over the states happened after the civil war it happened with war on drugs i mean mm. the war on drugs just absolutely um bright. i mean look at the way they use the interstate commerce clause which was <clears throat> only supposed to regulate commerce no tariffs between states and free free flow and then they could use it well california can't mm. can't legalize weed because it can make its way into Nevada and things like that. And then you want to take it and you want to basically say, well, if South Carolina doesn't want to have the death penalty, um, we're going to fe- we're going to make these federal crimes death penalty crimes so that we can, you know, de facto have, you know, they're not, you know, South Carolina is not going to put somebody to death, but we can definitely kill a someone from South Carolina. Mm. And this is it's insanity. I mean, it's just the way to they want to make the united states all one thing just like a lot of them want to make the world all one thing Mm -hmm. this is just a test case you know a lot of people have always been like oh what's the what's the new world order i'm like well the new world order starts here 
You can just look at the United States. Well, it's it is the forefront of international imperialism under the name of the sovereign rights of the global citizen. Yeah, yeah I think that there's there is some further more sections in this that I would sort of just want to jump about because there, it's it's quite nice watching how he then closes the loop. You know, he opens up these two ends of an arco and tyranny and sort of ties it all together in a way that makes sense as to why you would do it. <clears throat> in the first place, it is obviously an easy way for government bureaucrats and lawmakers to enhance their power and the public funds at their disposal by playing on legitimate and well-founded fears of citizens over crime. I mean, that is... I think he goes on to mention it later, but, you know, Higgs crisis in Leviathan, all the... You know the patterns we see in there. You talk about COVID. I mean, this is this is almost one of the key patterns to all political and state action, is the creation of false agitation towards some other ideological goal. Yeah, you know, the Higgs ratchet effect. Mm. They they just they can actually either use something organic or create something that causes them to just ratchet down more upon uh, your liberties and to, to increase their power. Mm. And I mean, there's no greater um, example of that than um, starting in March of 2020. And now mm. the fact that, you know, in March of 20, in February of 2020, I could pretty much fly anywhere in the world I want to. Mm. Now I don't want to fly anywhere in the world. From basically, on most days, I don't want to leave my house. Mm. But it, I mean, I, because of... you can see there are other points where he sort of mentions a similar relationship. But you know, this is very clearly, as you describe it, a caste sort of system, or you know, you could even maybe see it as the as class conflict, if you will. I mean, I, I stuck a wee bit of state and revolution into my notes. It's one of my best, the best bits from it, because there is so many other texts where this relationship shows up but the state is an organ of class rule an organ for the oppression of one class by another it is the creation of order which legalizes and perpetuates this oppression by moderating the conflict between the two classes and I, I, maybe it's not as obvious for everyone but especially reading people like Francis and Burnham and Hopper you know these people who I think you could maybe accurately refer to as of post-Marxists. They don't explicitly always frame it in that way, but you can see the influence from you know a Marx or a Lenin or even Engels, and the way that they use and describe the state as, you know, just a a vehicle for placing violence upon one class and alleviating it from another, whoever those classes need be for the convenient political program you're running at the time. Much to, much to be learned from Lenin. Much <laughs> oh, to be learned from the, from the communists. Uh, I quite like the bit at the bottom of the paragraph here as well. <clears throat> Thus, there can be no local politician who wins election by promising and carrying out an effective program of crime fighting, because any effective laws or punishments he might enact will be dependent upon the consent of the courts. Since law enforcement, sorry, since law enforcement remains primarily a local and state function, but is effectively under the control of federal courts, local law and order leaders can do nothing effective, and have to make do with a narco tyrannical applesauce. <laughs> I mean, this is one hundred percent. Yeah, I mean, this is 100%. the Cthulhu swims left sort of notion that we all get, and we all talk about. It is also directly appeals to a text that I was reading the other week for one of Academic Agent's streams. You know, we read through C.A. Bond's Nemesis, and it is not quite the same context that they are writing in, but, you know, his notion of, you know, if you have the federal power as a central power, the local powers as a secondary powers, and then these sort of periphery groups, or these periphery values like law and order and criminals and citizens and whoever else, you know, you can take use of these periphery groups and values and use them to essentially constantly attack these secondary systems of order 
and tell people that you're making them freer whilst ultimately putting your own finger in the pie at the same time. I mean, the, the quote I have from the book here, expansive power always promotes anarchistic appeals to the individual while it extends or while it expands its own further reach into the order in question. The anarchistic claims are applicable to other power centres but not to the centralising power centre itself. I mean, that is the relationship we're looking at here with all these different, you know, federal bills and the way that they are used. The there is always a top-down aspect of these reforms that's almost never-ending and because of the constant flow of them and where they come from you can't fight them and when you do try to fight them the way that they are framed allows your enemies to tell you or sorry to tell everyone else that you're you're a tyrant and you're not making people free I mean it's the reason why we end up in a position where there is that sort of binary system of thought around civil rights that there has only ever been Jim Crow era and then the pro, or, you know, the civil rights era, the the notion of sovereign property owners prior to that is something that isn't even considered. Despite that being the actual sort of anarchistic option, we are instead told that we are given freedom if we can just declare different random private individuals' property as public on the public's whim or the leader's whim. Go on. Uh, that's the, yeah. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know if you had anything to add to that or not. <laughs> oh, uh, you're doing. I mean, I read your notes, and I mean, you're kill. You were killing it on it, but um, I have nothing to add. Nothing better to add on that. Fair enough. All, all I would suggest maybe is uh, if you can get a hold of that book. If not, I can possibly send you a PDF. It is a very good read. <clears throat> yeah, do that. Cool. Uh, While crime and public safety remain important and legitimate concerns of voters, the response of politicians and police almost has to be pro- oh, sorry, almost has to be uh, has to be to promise the false and dangerous solutions of an arco tyranny, to change subtly the definition of crime by expanding it to include the innocent and the law-abiding, and to avoid any serious challenge to real criminals, and institutionalising anarcho tyrannical functions in such agencies as the BATF merely creates incentives for its bureaucrats to pursue this kind of dangerous and useless measures that it's become notorious for. Under an tyranny, the state creates a problem which sometimes actually has come to, oh, sorry, some connection to reality, declares an emergency or crisis, the drug war, drug emergency areas, the carjacking crisis, Islamic fundamentalism, and then exploits that problem as an instrument by which it continues to enhance its power. Through neither the fake problem it exploits nor the real problem that exists is affected. The anar- sorry, the anarchy that anarcho tyranny breeds thus serves as the rationale for the tyranny it builds. And dynamic of sorry, and the dynamic of anarcho tyranny is essentially the same ratchet effect that Robert Higgs identifies as the principle of big government in the twentieth century. I mean this is also just the Hegel- Hegelian idea of problem reaction solution. Oh, you can that was so much of that um i didn't really learn about that until the the obama administration Mm. i really saw that in the obama administration especially when it came to foreign policy yeah yeah uh i just i think i was skipped to one last paragraph at the bottom here because it was one i rather enjoyed and then we can sort of talk back and forth because we've got until nine o'clock if that's all right with you or i think that'd be like four o'clock your time let's do it cool uh, oh, I just need to find the quote. <laughs> Hence, just as Americans in this mass managerial regime are dependent upon mass corporations, offices and factories for their livelihoods, just as they are dependent on mass political parties and illusory mass participation in the political process, just as they are dependent on and are dependent on and engulfed by the mass culture that is continuously fed to them in spectator sports, television, film, art, music and popular literature, and just as in all these dimensions of life, Americans increasingly surrender the active and participatory roles that the Republican government demands. 
so too in an arco tyranny we are habituated to an entirely passive role in securing our protection from criminals. George Will's police saturation is indeed the logical and practical practical outcome of this kind of mass pacification, as more and more Americans swallow the lie that they are too stupid and too reckless to protect themselves, their homes and their families, and that cops who can barely make it through high school and bureaucrats who cannot support themselves outside a government payroll must do it for them. I mean, to me, I, I, I read that and I just, I just hear Ted Kaczynski, you know, especially his focus on ma- <clears throat> sorry, mass and scale you know, these are the the key aspects Ted refers to in the process of detachment and over socialization. You you know, you can't you can't have that over socialization without the mechanisms to develop it. In the same way that you cannot have the the, the disorder within society unless you have a subset of people who are boss bought into that mass culture that's telling them there is no disorder. I mean, look at the. I love this part right here that they're too stupid and too reckless to protect themselves. And then he immediately says that, you know, the cops who can barely make it through high school and the bureaucrats who can, can't even support themselves outside of, you know, tax money. I mean, talk about where does, where is there any room in there for intelligent people? Hmm. I mean, the, I guess you could make the argument that the people who've convinced themselves that they're, they've swallowed the lie that they're too stupid um, could be fairly intelligent. And, you know, more and more of those people wake up all the time, just not in large enough numbers. And the bureaucrats, a lot of them are smart. A lot of them are government jobs because, you know, they are, they could actually be self aware that they can't make it in the private sector so that they need to do this. Also, some of them could have sociopathic kind of um, personalities, so this is the best place for them to go. Um, just like, you know, a, someone who's a pedophile might want to become a teacher to be around kids. Um, this, I mean, how does, a, how does a society come out of that? If you have, a, if the overwhelming majority of the people believe that they're too stupid and too reckless to protect themselves, and then ones who are on the streets who are supposed to protect them are too stupid to barely make it through high school. Then the bureaucrats may be, may not be much smarter than the average person, but they're more conniving. Mm. So you have a class of people who are absolutely Machiavellian against a class of people who believe, who are completely in rendered helpless their own minds hmm. what's how do how does anybody expect to, how does anybody expect to to change that how do you how do you change it hmm. well he, he goes on a further point here yeah there are the signs that some americans are not buying into the lie of anarcho tyranny at least as far as crime and personal safety are concerned some are awakening to the ancient lesson of republican government that in order to govern yourself politically you must first be able to govern yourself personally and morally which is, I mean, one of the, I think you, uh, I think it was the second part when you were talking to Aaron about Ted K's manifesto, you said the phrase, you know, to, to ultimately change a society, he must change its culture, which I think that's what this, that's what he's suggesting here as well. And that there is a sort of deeper level to that, whereby the culture is in and of itself a product of our system of law. And as you have, you know, the civil rights agenda, which takes the way, or takes, you know, the the right for people to exclude on their property away from them, as you have ever growing gun laws that take away their ability to defend themselves, it is no wonder why they would then feel like they need the state to take up that job for them. Uh, And there let me read this again because the ending of this is at least as far as crime and personal safety are concerned some are awakening to the ancient lesson of republican government that in order to govern yourself politically you must first be able to govern yourself personally and morally yeah i mean mean, i think and that's the answer the answer Mm. to the question i asked about how 
you know, you, you have these very smart but sociopathic people ruling over some people who are very smart, just they've been convinced that they're not and they've been convinced not to think. Um, the way out of that is that um, basically defaulting to a society or a mindset where um, people are must govern themselves personally and morally and they have to have high moral standards and i think that go, that goes right to hapa mm. well, you know, hapa would be the first one yes that was gonna say one of the points i put in the notes that you know this is a direct appeal to time preference and that because we live you know in a political structure and that all political structures are ultimately top down if the people at the top are conniving trying to take advantage of the controls they are given in the shortest time period possible for the greatest loot. It is no wonder then that it has such horrific effects on the average person's ability to see solutions to problems around them because they are told day in, day out from school and to university and to their job that solving problems isn't their problem, that's somebody else's problem. You know, that's that's what the government is there for, <laughs> don't you know? <laughs> Uh, I mean, self-governance is just not taught. Hmm. Um, that's, I mean, if you're in, if you grew up in church and you grew up in a good church, you know, one that preaches morality, you know, preach, I don't want to get deep into that. But, <laughs> I mean, we could, but then you have a better chance of making it through. But, you know, the, most of the churches in, even most of the churches in the United States, and I assume around the world, are not are going to have flags at the front of the front of the church. Mm. You know, so it's it's not like the early Christians who would have been devout to Christ. That maybe when they were out in public, they um, deferred to Caesar. At least, you know to stay alive mm. they didn't really mean it they just did it and um you don't have ch you don't have churches teaching that today you know there well i mean you do have churches teaching that today i'm sure someone could list a church in the comments or something like that and that just proved my point mm. you know, the, the fact is that the overwhelming majority of churches are not um are not teaching that and they're not teaching self-government mm. really honestly they're not <laughs> they just <laughs> you know i mean I mean, that's the, the sort of rough point he goes into the end here, that people need to be conscious of their own security and the resources, networks and skills that they need to do that. They are not only not taught those things, they are actively told not to go and teach themselves those things because those things are wrong. <laughs> For one reason or another, you know, defending yourself, defending your property, doing as you feel is correct is not the way to go as far as they're concerned. It's a um, big, the biggest problem we have now, and the reason why this article needed to be written and narco tyranny is a reality is lack of personal and oral belief the fact that people don't this isn't even something that most I think in the United States would give consideration to in most of their life it, throughout their whole life mm. and the average person just doesn't under these things Mm. And, you know, it's one, it's one of those things that's hard to um, even talk about. You know, and when you read this, you know, I read this and it's like, it's kind of hard for me to comment on this because it's like it comments on itself so well. Mm. He's, there's, what do you say? I mean, this is like one of those things that you quote. <laughs> yeah. mm. And I mean, less, I mean, how do you, when you read something like this, you also want to try and come away with answers. How do we fix this? I mean, honestly, I, there's only one, as far as I'm concerned, there's only one way to fix this. And then, you know, it would have to be 
small groups, you know, Hoppe, what Hoppe talks about, hmm. breaking off into small groups and people of like minds. And uh, you know, he talks about what must be done, hmm. um, basically having your own, getting enough people to mobilize to take over a city, something like that, and uh, start to privatize things. Yeah, and, I mean, I, I don't, I'll be honest, take for the argument of the, you know that we only exist in this current framework because people at some point had weak morals I, I didn't take too much of a kind of elitist perspective on the formulation of society anymore to really fully buy that and it's not because you know I think that the people are inherently clueless it is just the nature of human organisation is the influence always comes from the top down. It is never bottom up. You know, we do not, we do not, in a sense, allow the system in front of us. It is imposed upon us, and we try and rebel against it as much as we can. And sometimes you are left a very, very narrow margin of rebellion. And if you step outside of that, you you're a criminal. You know, as we saw in the article especially if you understand consciously that the political class is a class that you are not a part of and that is ultimately an enemy class, if you act on those ideals, you will be treated again, you know, by them as someone who's from an enemy class. It is almost, it's highly sort of schmidt in nature. Uh, you know, and the more you contemplate that the more you start thinking about um yarvin clear mm. pill you know just basically detaching and considering yourself like a um like a prisoner or like you know living in occupied mm. in an occupied territory or like or even younger's idea of the anarch where mm. you know you you're just going through life and you're basically laughing at everything you're just you're looking at it and it's like i'm not going to let this affect me i'm just gonna and it's not being an anarchist because being an anarchist you know normally means that you're just you have this belief in something and you're not really doing anything about it but being the anarch you are actually living you are actually living out those principles where it's like okay well i mean i, I think everything i think this is all a joke mm. and i'm just gonna live my life and not let it uh let it affect me that's the, I guess some people would call that the black pilled approach, mm. and you know, but is it? When you, if you're, if you're of the belief that nothing, you can't change it, it's not going to change in your lifetime. That's. I don't well, know if that's black. I don't know if that's black pilled. It can be immensely liberating. I mean, I I have been reading a lot of Carlyle recently. And the way he talks about the the importance of hierarchy hierarchy as a sort of metaphysical truth, you know, as as a constant aspect of all human behaviour, it really makes you, as you're sort of suggesting there, you just come to terms with the fact that no matter what political structure you live in, if you are not part of the elites, you live in some form of serfdom. And today we have a sort of neo-feudalist system where you live with all the strictures of, you know, a 14th century peasant serf, but you also have the anxiety of having to learn to be free at the same time. <laughs> you know, as, as anarcho-tyrannical as that may sound. Yeah, well, all of that and you have air conditioning. Mm. It was, <laughs> was the air conditioning really worth it? Well, you know, that was a... I forget who I asked that question to. I think I asked it. I can't remember who I asked it to. I said that, um, did they think that if World War One hadn't happened and they hadn't toppled all of the houses, all of the monarchies in Europe, would we still have air conditioning? <laughs> <laughs> or if you want to go even back further, you know, if the United, if the, the colonists decide to rebel against mm. the regulars, it would they, um, we still have air conditioning today. Well, I think, I mean, <laughs> I, I, this is why I would, again, I would recommend that CA Bond Nemesis book. I can, I can send you a PDF for it because I think 
as someone who is possibly in a slightly similar position to myself where you spend you know you spend a lot of your time reading a lot of libertarian theory and as much as it is you know coherent it is great to read and it teaches you loads of things about ethics ultimately in the real world that stuff doesn't exist and you have to start stripping aspects of liberalism away from the strategy you're going to use to achieve this libertarian order and in reading that book and thinking more about the evolution of political structures over any time period there becomes things that are so inevitable i mean again the way carlisle talks about democracy he's living in a britain at a time that has 20,000 people that vote and he's sitting there being like yeah we're gonna have universal democracy at some point it's inevitable and i think it's you know no matter through which structure you see it it becomes obvious that there are there are these inevitabilities whether it's through kaczynski that you see man's you know dissolution with the world around him is becoming an inevitability and ergo why we would end up in something like vr for the rest of our lives or whether you look through the juvenilian structure and you understand that you know ever more anarchistic claims to see universal suffrage so that all men rule all men and we're all on an equal peg as far as political power is concerned these claims always then lead to central power in the same way that you know the developments of technology always lead to a more centrally powerful and harder to defeat sort of techno structure oh yeah i mean when when you start taking into consideration what technology allows them to do i had um i think a good argument that that i've talked to a, um, a couple other people about is um whether this losing of privacy mm. is a good thing because also that means that the elites lose privacy well they don't know yeah and that's because and that's the, one of the one of the main issues yeah the the media That'd be will estimated. never put out their details in the way that they do about say for example the guy in the article that ended up getting the ticket you know he and he ends up becoming public enemy number one because he gets a barking ticket but we still don't know what's on hunter biden's laptop and if, well, I mean, if that isn't privacy, I don't know what is. I mean, well, there is a class of people that were, were not allowed to... Uh, there's, a, there's a class of people that are always going to be protected. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, well, what's going on right now? No, exactly. Jelaine, I mean, Max, Jelaine Maxwell trial. I mean, what do you think we're going to learn from this? Uh, there's, there's not even... As far as I know, there aren't even cameras inside the... Uh, no, I don't think there is. The... I, I was actually thinking more of COVID. And it was, a, it was an interesting point that someone had made. Is that if you are made of mega money and you've got more money than cents, you can tr- still travel around the world doing whatever you want because the cost, you know, if, if plane tickets double and the fine for not self isolating is $1,000, if you're going to blow ten, fifteen thousand dollars $15,000 doing some holiday somewhere, What's an extra two or three thousand to you? It's nothing, and so your your liberties are still, you know, you're still happy to exercise those because it's costing you almost nothing. But if you are, if you're not part of that sort of bourgeois moneyed class, international travel is now almost an impossibility. I mean, it's. <sighs> What was Aaron saying last year? He, I think he started this very soon after COVID. Was that um, we're going to have to in, reintroduce class theory <laughs> in order to in order to fight this? Because the um, it's becoming very clear to a lot of people, especially well, mostly on the right in this country, that they are a second class. I mean, if they're if they're white. It already puts them puts them in a hole but you know even larry elder black gentleman who ran for uh ran in the governor runoff in california he was the black he was considered to be the black face of white supremacy mm. 
I, I actually wonder because I mean I don't know. Have you read Francis's Leviathan and its Enemies? I listened to it, but oh man, I'm trying to remember when I did. I, I, I know it's it is a it is one of another one of those like eight hundred odd page tomes. I be I oh. think Aaron would enjoy it though because that is what you were suggesting there is essentially what Sam Francis is trying to tell you is that whether you believe in class war or not, they do, and they have been enacting it since at least as early as the nineteen hundreds upon us. So, you know, get wise and consolidate as a class against your enemy or prepare to be rid off the face of this planet. <laughs> I know, it's... Class theory right now is very easy. It would be very easy to explain because you could make it as simple as Hoppe's. You could actually make it as simple as Konkin's. Mm. And, and it'll work. And well, actually, the Conkins, you could even like. I would tweak it. Mm. I'd tweak it. I don't. I don't know that I would go directly with Hoppos, but Conkins could be tweet. Uh, could be tweaked, and I think it would make a lot of sense to people. That's that's why I like the uh, blend of Hoppy and Leninism. You know, you've got <laughs> you've got your your hardcore natural rights theory mixed with a conscious ideological understanding of the dangers of international capital. Don't know. Don't know what really more you could ask for in your structure of politics. Aaron does a really good job of being able to um, to use Leninism, to use Marxist Leninism, to explain what's going on today to right wing libertarians. Mm. Oh, no, I mean, it's as long as you have got enough understanding of like Hoppe and Rothbard. It, it comes to you. I mean, again, that line I read from State and Revolution, that doesn't just appear in Hoppe and Rothbard. I mean, again, a few weeks back, I'm reading a bit of Schopenhauer, you know, he talks about the state as this ultimate entity which provides security for one group against another. You know, it's, it's almost word for word this exact same understanding that Lenin has, maybe not with this conscious aspect that the order that is being created may be false, but that notion that the state in and of itself, especially in the modern context, has become a nexus, maybe not necessarily for class conflict at all times, but for some other type of conflict. Yeah, 100%. And, I mean, we're in it right now. Mm. Well, don't. Uh, and there are still people. There's still people who don't realize it. Mm. I mean, we're we have the conflict that we could use it for right now. <laughs> people don't don't realize it. I mean, from where did I see? I think it was. I can't remember where I saw the picture from. There was a literal like one one side of the fence. Uh, walking down the street was for vaccinated people. The other side were front unvaccinated. Hmm. What's well, the? I can't remember. It's is the drinking water fountain meme. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we already had a, we already had apartheid in this country, and and um, we're looking at it again. What the funny thing is is the people, people who would tell would be the most outraged. I had the Jim Crow laws and everything mm. and the apartheid that existed in this country are the ones calling for apartheid now and <laughs> it's not only against black people but funny thing is a good majority of black people it is against because they don't want that thing mm. <laughs> so it's the, uh, it's the IQ bell curve it's the midwits that want the jab <laughs> that's all we need yeah. to know <clears throat> No, I, I'm I'm preparing for it myself over here. I mean, we see so much talk of digital IDs and vaccine passports now that I, I've almost kind of accepted that it's already coming and that when it has arrived here, you know, there will be people who own businesses who will not accept me anymore, and that is just how it's going to be because I will stand my ground on these principles because it's people didn't do it with a mask thing. And I can understand partially why, because on its own it seems like a small part of it. 
But now that we look at the, you know, the now nearly two year long picture of COVID, each aspect of it comes together and goes, you know, piece by piece. And if you keep getting to each piece and you decide, well, it's only one other small thing, you you give up to the whole system. And you might as well just have gone along with the whole program from the start. I mean, they're... um... Ben Armani was saying last year in uh, might have been the middle of last year when he was saying that it was going to get to the point where people would be, you know, 40 year old men and women were going to be saying, um, you know, we've always worn masks. Mm. I have I, I like have my ma- I have my mask from high school somewhere around here. <laughs> Uh, yeah, the, like anachronistically making like a film about an era prior to COVID, but having people in masks for it, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, they're uh, oh yeah, I can just I can just imagine that they're going to take a masterpiece like Casablanca and mask everyone. Oh, God, fucking end me. <laughs> <laughs> uh. I mean, it's I I don't watch TV. Um, I haven't watched you know network TV in a very long time, mm. and we, my uh, future father-in-law was visiting for Thanksgiving, and he's like, "Oh, can you turn on the football game?" And I'm like, "And I've heard the football's gotten totally woke, mm. even during the broadcasts and everything." And uh, American football, not real football, but the oh God, neither of them are real as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> he told me, um, "Well, one, you only really need a ball." Not a not not thousands of dollars worth of equipment, and um, con- and concussions, maybe uh, some. But he told me he he like did me such a favor. He's like, um, oh, can you turn just turn the turn it uh, the sound off? I was like, <laughs> oh, thank you, thank you. All right, I can watch now. I I might be able to enjoy this just a hair, mm. you know, but I'm just not going to look at the commercials because. Uh, I haven't watched commercials or anything since this all started since March of last year. I mean, I, I stopped listening. I stopped watching cut the cable TV mm. years ago. I stopped watching cable, uh, getting cable TV years ago. So, um, but I've heard that some of the commercials now are just so mm. I, fucked. I struggle to actually watch things even on YouTube now. Because every 10 minutes I'm bombarded with an advert about racial equality or sustainability. And I'm af- I don't know. I'm afraid we'll kind of need to end it here. I think it's, I don't know, possibly just an excuse to have a more casual conversation at some point if, if either Absolutely. of us is available for that. <laughs> I don't know, maybe on yours that, next time. <laughs> yeah, that, that sounds good to me. Cool. Right. Uh, well, I just want to thank everyone that showed up and has watched people who are members of the channel those who donate and whatever else you are the people that keep this whole thing sort of churning and allow us to make stuff for you to watch and read and whatever else i will also do my cartel duties and shell apostolic majesty's history stream with a fair few people uh, starting in a couple of minutes Uh, if you've got anything else to say before we go Oh, just thank you. Thank you. It was a good conversation. I wish I could have added more, but there's just something about this article that is, it says it all. Mm. It's one of those ones you, I always use this phrase, but you either get it or you don't. (laughs) Yeah, seriously. Anyway, good evening, everyone.